Uh, hi, everybody. Um, thanks for coming and for, in, for some of you <coughs> waiting here for like an hour for us to start. Um, <laughs> we had kind of an early keynote. And so, um, yeah, so today we're going to have a relatively loosely structured panel um, that's mostly going to consist of, I think, uh, all of us, meaning you and us on the panel, um, arguing for the next hour and a half. <laughs> Um, about what museum websites or websites slash digital presences are really supposed to be. So this discussion actually sort of came out of originally um, an impromptu unconference session that we had at museums. All right, so I guess catering is right on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, an impromptu session we had at Museums in the Web uh, last April um, about sort of because so many of us are either you know in the midst of a website redesign, contemplating a website redesign, or have just completed a website redesign, um, starting to look at exactly what it is that we're supposed to be doing with that. Because um, I think, as I said in that session, I know probably for a lot of you, you get the same sort of directive that I got when I was tasked with um, overseeing the relaunch of our own site, DenverArtMuseum.org, which is basically give us our existing site, but with racing stripes on it. You know, so not really questioning whether any of the models upon which we already build our sites, and you know, most of us, like the only real differences between most museum websites tend to be kind of design differences. And so what we wanted to look at was, does that model actually work? Did it ever work? And if it does, like, okay, fine, let's keep building that. Um, but if not, we need, really need to back up and readdress that and question a lot of the assumptions that we are building our digital presences on. Um, so. That sort of turned into um, a talk that I did at Ignite Smithsonian, which I think probably, <laughs> <laughs> who was that? <laughs> um, and, uh, and we wanted to sort of continue this conversation with some of my favorite people to talk with um, about this sort of stuff. Well, I like talking about them about lots of things, but um, about this topic in particular. Um, so we have, um, and they're gonna introduce themselves to you separately, but. Uh, we have uh, Eric Johnson, Nate Solis, Mia Ridge, and Suze Carnes. Um, and actually, I'll just let you guys introduce yourselves. Sure. So, yeah. Um, Eric Johnson, I'm now at the Scholars Lab at UVA, but spent the past five years up to July at Monticello in Charlottesville, Virginia, yeah, at their library and helping out with the website. I'm Nate Solis. I'm a senior new media developer at the Walker Art Center, and we are in the midst of a redesign, hopefully just a couple weeks away from kicking it out the door. So a lot of this good thinking came just a bit too late for me. <laughs> um, but it's a good time to reflect on it. So hopefully yeah. we'll have a good talk. Um, I'm Mia Ridge. I'm a PhD student in digital history. Um, before that, I was lead web developer for the Science Museum. And I've survived uh, website redesigns in uh, Museum of London and Museum Victoria in the past. Yep, so my name's Suze Cairns. Um, I sit in three different areas, so I'm a PhD student as well, and I'm really looking at the way the online museum collection challenges the notion of what a museum is from an historical and philosophical perspective. But I'm also at a regional art gallery in Australia, and I'm at the Powerhouse Museum, where I'm doing some research which will actually lead into the redesign of their online collection. So I sort of wear a couple of hats there. Yeah, that's right. Um, so, get back to the music. <laughs> yes. Back to the music. Yes. And now uh, I'd like to hear from Mr. R. Kelly. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, the, the format of the panel today is actually going to be fairly loose. We have kind of a loose narrative, but um, I want to emphasize that um, anybody can ask questions at any point. Um, just raise your hand <laughs> um, or shout it out if you're that kind of person, I suppose. Um, and we are. I'm especially interested in hearing <laughs> from the people who don't normally shout it out. So, <laughs> so yeah. do keep your hand up, and and let's hear from everyone. Or use Twitter as well with yes. the hashtag. Yeah, yeah we. I, it was decided in the last five or ten seconds that WPMW is the, which is totally easy to remember, uh, <laughs> is the uh, the hashtag for for this. So um, I think <laughs> we've got a lot of laptops open on the table, so we will be watching it. Um, I do want to emphasize though that here today we want to kind of keep the emphasis on. Um, goals and vision, um, recognizing that a lot of the things that we may talk about today, you may look at your own institution and say, well, my director would never go for that in a million years, or my curators would be crazily resistant to that idea. 
recognizing that there's a lot of strategy involved in implementing many of the things that we might talk about today that might be extremely difficult, onerous, or impossible, or in some cases very easy, depending on where you are. So, um, you know, our, our purpose here is not necessarily to, to gripe about what we're doing or to gripe about our own sites, but just to sort of address maybe what might be fundamental and structural weaknesses. So, um, pandas. And so, uh, I want to sort of kick off really by starting to talk about um, exactly what our websites should perhaps be doing. Um, and, you know, many of us like build our websites really based on kind of a somewhat innate or intuitive knowledge of what we think they should do um, without necessarily always running that up against um, our visitors, our users, and seeing exactly what, what it is that they want and whether those two things have anything to do with one another. So uh, I think Nate's gonna. Well, we're all gonna we're all gonna take turns. I'm gonna start yeah. here, um, and I, the way I want to phrase this, I guess, is that we all have mission statements at our institution, and we work really hard on them. And um, our mission statements, our missions in general, have very little to do with what people actually want from our website. It turns out, I think. And this is coming after our redesign where I did troll through our search logs, looked at what people are doing on our site. And in, in many cases, the public need from our website is just the hours, what's on, staff list, and can I work there? And we're now answering those on our homepage. So ideally, we're not going to get any other traffic on our website <laughs> if we've done our job, right? And, and more ideally, no one will get there because Google will have crawled it They'll start to type it in, see their answer, and we'll have zero traffic. So that's sort of, <laughs> but that's obviously not what we want, because then we have just given up on our actual Sorry. mission. Or is it? Yeah. It's what the public wants for sure. Right. And by the public, I mean the 99% that aren't going to, <laughs> to dig into the rest of our website. Um, I don't know if I should address the, who wants to riff on that? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I can too. Well, yeah. I think it, how are you defining users when you say that? Um, if you've got the 99% who just want to get in, find the directions, find out what's on when, and then actually go to the museum, that's fine. But what about the two times, three times, four times numbers of visitors who are only visiting us online? And where Correct. does that leave them? Correct. Uh, so this is, this is the great point that we have where um, there are, in fact, some institutions here that do only exist digitally. There is no physical museum to go to. Their website is not going to be sought after for hours and what's on. Um, so we do need more content than that. Uh, I think those of us with a physical presence try to lure people to our site looking for the hours and then trick them into finding <laughs> our mission statement and doing the work that we that we want them to do and like fulfill our artistic visions. And I think that's sort of the wrong way to go around it. So, But I, I would argue, I mean, we're sort of talking about what users do, not necessarily what users want. Uh, I mean, just because a lot of people come to the website purely for the hours, for what's on, that doesn't necessarily mean they, they might not want more that we're not delivering. Can I also just, <laughs> time, right just say, <laughs> when we say our website, do we mean literally only the presence that's under our branded URL, or do we mean our content on Flickr, our apps on Facebook, our apps on their mobiles? Do those experiences count under our websites? Mm. I'd like to limit today's discussion to the .org of our institution, <laughs> unless well, clearly we don't I have think, to. I think that'll, I mean, that probably will evolve through the conversation mm. as we, if we talk about social engagement, that may well be happening elsewhere, may also be happening on our site. Is that part of the goal of, you know, the site? Is that the audience? I mean, that is a good question about sort of definitions, as always, are the tricky thing. Well, and, hmm, sorry, go. No, I was just playing <laughs> the microphone. Well, and I, I, you know, I think sort of to, this is going to get awkward very fast. Um, I think to Sue's point, like part of what we have to address here is really like, are what users doing? Are they doing that because we basically have given them no other choice? Like, I mean, it, and is that the behavior we see because we actually are not, uh, 
we, we haven't really accustomed <coughs> users to, to actually looking for us, <coughs> looking to us for anything other than that stuff, other than right. where are we, when are we. I think I would actually challenge that because a lot of traffic on the Science Museum website was people playing games. Um, and it was, that was a really, really high proportion. It's partly because the Science Museum is really good at games. Um, but it's also because people were like a babysitter. You can plonk your kids down in front of the games at the Science Museum website and leave them and they're not doing dodgy things on the internet and you can go have a cup of tea and it's great. <laughs> and they're learning things. Mm -hmm. um, so people are doing, like if you make things and they match what people want and they're good quality and they can compete with other things on the internet, then people do want other things from our websites. Now, do you think that that's because something like games has the feel of more of a, uh, a sort of born digital property in, in, in the sense that like uh, you know, most museum websites are in essence modeled on a physical visit. There's, an assumption, there's an assumption that you're going to come in through that front door, you know, through in our case denverartmuseum.org. You'll spend 20 minutes there hanging out, going, you know, we hope longer, but probably not, you know, and, and then basically you leave and go somewhere else, you know, whereas here we're talking about a much different sort of like, I'm there for a specific activity. And, and this is sort of actually where I might want to expand the conversation a little bit outside of just the websites, but look in comparison to, and I'd be interested to hear some statistics or comments from the audience you know, like your, your museum's Flickr presence versus its mm -hmm. website brand. Like, do you see more traffic? Do you see a different kind of traffic? Do you see more engagement, more activity, you know, on your Facebook feed? I mean, I know in our case, it's like, yeah, on our own site, people go to hours, directions, and location. Or hours, directions, and what's on, sorry. Um, but on Facebook, there's a lot more and a very different kind of engagement. We have, actually have a much larger and more dedicated audience, partially because I think they're there for that activity. It's, it, sometimes it almost feels incidental that it has anything to do with us as Denver Art Museum, you know. Yeah, I'd absolutely agree with that. I follow on Facebook the Tate blog, um, and they always come up with really interesting art conversations, and I don't read every one, but then I will flick over to their blog and I will participate in those conversations. And so I'm part of a community that is discussing art. It just happens to be through the Tate. And so I think that's, in some ways, it's enabling communities in that way. Mm. Um, that's not necessarily because it is the Tate, although they happen to have great art and therefore that enlivens the discussion, but the community is the part that becomes important in that yeah. space. Mm -hmm. the, um, Clay Shirky did a the Smithsonian thing in back 2008 or nine, and he talked about the object as platform, so the object as something that people gather around and have experiences around and share conversations around. And I think what Facebook actually enables is that kind of thing. The Science Museum again had a um, an early music synthesizer, really boring object to look at, but amazing in terms of the history of the BBC Radiophonics Workshop. Um, and some of my friends are electronic musicians, and I spotted them on the Science Museum page having these really in-depth conversations about the ceramics machine. They like the Science Museum, but they'd never normally have a conversation about it. Mm -hmm. But the fact that we were talking about this one object, there were hooks, there was a way to get into the story like really in depth and a community was forming in a kind of ad hoc way around that discussion. And it's partly because Facebook is a place where you go to have conversations. You don't go to a museum website to have conversations because we're intimidating. Mm. Right. So to this original question on the, on the <coughs> screen, I think what we want out of our websites, when we build them, when we sit around brainstorming, we, we do want them to be a destination that people say, today I'm going to go to <laughs> walkerart.org and just see what's there, you know, like play around and dig deep in their content. And, um, that's, that's exactly right. That is not, we need to, we need to provide that content so that it is findable on our website. But the idea that someone is going to come there with this, with this big idea, I just, I, I really think we've been not building the wrong thing. And I want to be clear that we didn't just build, like our site is not just the hours and what's on, <laughs> right? We do, we do all the, all of these things because we, because we have to do them. Um, but the point is to make this content findable, discoverable by search engines. So I'm going to start everything by saying the point is. <laughs> the point is to make it findable and searchable and discoverable. And I don't just mean by Google. I mean so that someone having this conversation on Facebook it can be 
because this is, this is coming. We can do this on our own website where we can send them beyond our content. The next step, this is how we fulfill our mission. We've got them on this page somehow. We don't have to keep them on our website. We say, here's the rest of the world through our eyes. Here's these other things you might want to read. And other sites can start to do that too if our content is more discoverable and linkable. Um, I think, I, I know there's a question, but I just want to make a t quick little point on that. I think until now, we've never in museums allowed audiences to define what the conversation is. And it's a really important key difference is that actually the audiences can work out what's interesting for them and they can form communities around it. We are not necessarily the ones that define what's going to be interesting to people. And it doesn't have to and be on our website. Totally right. But it's already, it's already, it's already <laughs> happened. It's just that we've been able to... Um, the resistance that curators used to have to Web 2.0 was because mm. they had to listen to the conversations where previously, unless they were walking through a gallery, they never had to hear what the public was saying about the objects. True. Right. And so it's really challenging sometimes because they don't have the same appreciation. Um, they choose to interpret things willfully in different ways, yes. whatever, but we're actually having to engage with that now where we didn't have to before. Yes. Okay, before I disagree with that, I think we have a question. <laughs> there, some, there was a question? <laughs> I was just wondering, whose museum, put your hand up if your museum's done audience segmentation for online audiences. Like how widely is that? So it's starting to happen. Um, that people are of the... You just put the microphone in. Sorry. Um, I think the question was about how do we define more precisely the target audiences for museum content, um, if that's right. Yeah. to meet the need, how to create a website to meet the needs of those different audiences. Go, go ahead. Well, uh, basically, that's, that is the key question, it's a, and it's a really hard question, to actually look at, a, at an audience and ask them, what do you want out of our site, as opposed to looking at your website and saying, how is our audience using it? Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that the, the, the much more interesting question is the first one, sort of like, hey, you know, how do you talk about that? And I think the, the challenge is that we're not sure, you know, or over time, museums haven't been sure about how audiences are going to want to use the site. And so the solution ends up being trying a lot of different things and then sort of seeing what works. So you sort of come around to that second way of looking at it, unfortunately, um, and just by virtue of experimenting a little bit. You know, and then there's sort of all this cultural kind of expectation that grows up around museum websites, too, that if you try something completely innovative, if you're trying to be engaging in a new way, but nobody else is doing it, then your audience isn't expecting that, then it takes them a long time to discover it. How long do you keep that effort up? You know, it's, it's you know, my, my th answer is, I'm not sure what the answer is. I so think, I don't know. if I may chime in for a moment. I, no. No. <laughs> oh, Panda. I'll be out in the, in the hallway. Um, I, I, I gotta be honest, like to a certain extent, I'm, I'm not sure that I believe in identifying our target audiences as the right way to build, mm. partially because I feel like we haven't reached that audience yet. So, so in, in a way, like, I don't think they even know that we would want to identify them. Like, right. and so I wouldn't actually know how to build for them, you know? And so, but I do want to disambiguate and make it clear that just because you're not necessarily building for a specific or multiple specific target audiences, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're building for a mass audience either. And I think, like, I mean, that's some of where um, in Rob Stein's recent series of posts, like, one of the, um, on the participatory museum, like, one of the things that, that I was thinking is, like, 
I, I sort of feel like to a certain extent, and I'm, this will probably get me fired, but I mean, <laughs> to a certain extent, like we have to kind of embrace that cowboy and sort of say, you know, like, hey, we are a museum. We sort of kind of like do what we do. And here's what we think is awesome. And if that works, mm -hmm. then we succeed. If it doesn't work, then maybe we close, <laughs> you know, but, uh, but You're I mean, fired. Yeah. That? yeah, I know, I'm totally Anathema. fired. <laughs> yeah. it's, that, it's the Henry Ford not building faster horses, it's building a car. Yeah. Like yeah. it's that same idea exactly. of if we're defined by our audiences and by what they currently want, we're only going to make, uh, you know, a website with pinstripes. So, but right. can I just, I mean, I would make a plea also to say we do know some things about online audiences. We know sure. what educators want, we know what people making physical visits want. There are, and, we can't throw everything out. Some of that is embracing your own identity, too, though, I think. You know, like, in, in our case, like, Denver has a very unique demographic, like, in its community that we do have to understand. I don't know how much that actually translates to our, our online audience, mm -hmm. like, the audience that would engage with our, our online presence versus our physical presence, but we, we do have to understand that, yeah. So of the people who put their hands up for, yes, we've done audience segmentation surveys, does anybody feel like you nailed it? <laughs> and it's working for you? Well, I, I wouldn't say we nailed it. Yeah? We're in the midst of the redesign of the new museum website, and there was the, the initial uh, drive, I suppose, it's also driven also by technical consideration, is to uh, consolidate the different websites that we have into a one unique website that has all this content. What we found is that you know certain groups of very specific tailored needs that are mm -hmm. served really well in those mini websites. For instance, teachers. There is the, the temptation to centralize ignores the possibility that you cannot make an interface that works for everybody and for <coughs> every specific need. Teachers just want to get the source material for teaching. They don't need to go through the wormhole of all kinds of different elements in the website just to get the material. I'm actually sorry. I'm I'm actually curious about both that and and other institutions that have done audience segmentation. Did anybody who did that not arrive at exactly the same audience segments that everybody arrives at? Yeah. Uh, you know, like the lurkers, the searchers. The, I forget what all the. You the know, Morris Hargraves style yeah, model, you know, searches, or the, researchers, you know, followers. Right. Or age group segmentation. Did anybody not basically arrive at those same segments that? I can say does? from. Um, so when I worked for the Science Museum, that was part of a museum family with a railway museum and a media museum. And we did physical audience segmentation and online audience segmentation. And the audiences were quite different because something like a railway museum has a really specific type of visitor. And also the motivations for visitors, they were more about they were led by one person in the family. Mm -hmm. um, so <coughs> their needs and searches was, we were trying to push the fact that there's more to us than just railways. Um, so they did actually turn out to be quite different segments, although maybe they fall into the same kind of lines of a bit nerdy about your particular subject. <laughs> not yet nerdy, but interested. <laughs> Does not care. That Potentially. This is actually the, kind of the point that I wanted to make too, which is it, it's sort of a plea against audience segmentation study, because I think, at least in my experience, is that people who basically do this stuff enough in a museum you start to, you get your audience. I mean, you know, I'd almost want to see a, you know, a show of hands, how many people feel like they, they get the audience that they're trying to serve? Are there anybody? <laughs> so, or just not, I mean, like, because my sense is that we, you know, had a pretty good idea at Monticello about who these different people were that liked Thomas Jefferson, you know, in some broad sense. There were the people who loved the garden stuff, there were the people who loved the political stuff, there were the people that loved the architecture stuff, you know, and they weren't always the same people. They were sometimes the same people. But we knew that we had to feed content out to those people. But it was, you know, we didn't do a study to sort of figure that out. But it seemed to, at least in terms of, of, you know, social media growth and that kind of thing, seemed to be a kind of effective way 
to do some audience segmentation, audience understanding. And so, so I, I sort of want to put a plug in for the art side of this work too. You know that that instinct and guts. You know from people who who kind of are engaged with your museum, you people, us people. You know, trust that a little bit too. What I'm curious about is, has anybody that, and what that brings up for me is like, has has anybody done a sort of in a way, like a non-organic audience segmentation, where you intentionally segmented your audience in a particular way and built according to that. Um, this is VNA. Yeah, Sorry, can you? We're getting yeah. rumble over here. Mm -hmm. And amongst that online only segment, was there any further gradation there? Well, I was about to say, so I've just done some collection, so looking at collection segmentation at the powerhouse, and we've sort of found that there's probably four types of people that come to the collection, and this leads into the authority thing, because there's a real difference between those who want authority and those who just want information. So like the pop, the pop quiz people who are sitting there in the middle of the pub and they just want some trivia information. And I think that's about 80% of the people who come to the online collection are those people who are just after, they're still after information, but they just want a quick answer. But then we've got the kids who are there for school or for assignments and those sorts of things, and that's a percentage. And then we've got the people who are very definitely after the powerhouse collection. And that's, that is, a, there is a group of people. And then we've got the sort of amateur collectors who are really after this information about this object. So we're an applied arts and science museum, so we have a lot of objects um, like uh, fashion or you know antique clocks and those sorts of things. So you get really passionate collectors, but they don't necessarily know that they're coming to the powerhouse to look. They just want that information from someone they can trust. And then they can sort of later on come and seek us out. And they can be converted to being the ones who are really seeking us out intentionally. And those, those issues of authority start to come in there because there are people who definitely want information they can trust rather than some who just want an answer. Nice segue, Suze. Thanks. Um, <laughs> nice. <laughs> so keeping us on track here, um, one of the things that has, has started to come up in, in our own conversations here is, is thinking about one, one of the kind of very bedrock assumptions that a lot of museum websites are based upon is this idea of sort of trust and authority. That it's like, oh, people come to our sites because we are an authoritative source. Um, and um, what we want to talk about here a little bit is sort of whether that assumption is actually true in the digital domain or not. Like museums have basically made an assumption that the authority that they've kind of amassed as physical buildings um, basically automatically would carry over into the online world and that we wouldn't necessarily have to have all the same signifiers of authority that say a born digital presence like Wikipedia would have to have. Um, and so I wanted to actually address this a little bit, Eric. Do you so, want sure. to um, rock in that a bit? Yeah, well, sure. I mean, it's kind of interesting journey, I think, to move from, you know, it's institution that's, that really is this bedrock of authority and that's sort of how it's been pitched for so long to, I think, the, you know, a few years ago, the pendulum swung sort of really far the other way in a lot of places to being like, hands off, the public should be completely, you know, mm -hmm. their voice should be the thing that's heard and the museum should almost step back to what I think is probably the, the best bet, which is a little bit at the center. I mean, you know, I hate to mm -hmm. sort of be as so controversial as to be centrist. Um, <laughs> Get <laughs> so, out. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> but, but um, 
I think that the audience still kind of wants the museum's voice heard. Like they want that authority. They want to, you know, the, there are reasons that a museum has these professionals that are working and I think most museum audiences understand that. They don't want just, just a platform where they get to talk, you know, their own opinions, that sort of thing. But, so they want to hear from the museum, but they don't want that to be the sole voice, you know, in the discussion. And nor, I think, should it be sort of the decisive voice. Like, you know, you people talk amongst yourselves for a while and then we'll step in and tell you what the truth is. You know, that's, that's I think, not the effective way to do it either. But to be really part of the, a participant in the conversation with all the, not necessarily authority, but expertise that a museum brings to bear on this conversation. So I'd be much more interested in questions about museum expertise than museum authority, I think. <laughs> not me. That's but, not, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, do we have uh, yeah. another question? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, seriously, step up, people. Well, I, I, but you're saying it's if it's easy to find, it's not as. I see. Yes. I'm seeing it reflected on the museum researchers. So you need to see that they did the work. You, they know things yeah. you don't know. Yeah. A little more yes. context yeah, to that work. Museum experts. Right. So, I mean, does that come into the point where we create authority by showing our workings, by showing the sources? Because the one thing that museums really have is we have the objects. We're not just people sitting in a library, people researching on the internet, we're working with the objects and there's almost a reflection of the charisma of objects in the information that we mm. convey. And that the physical venue conveys that really well because you walk in and there are giant things on the ceiling and on cases. The online museum doesn't necessarily do that. It's just text on a page. Every page on the internet is just text on a page or images on a page. So how do we claim authority? How do we show that we have authority? Well, and this is something that Eric and I were talking about before the session is thinking about like, like you know, it's it's less about sort of do people want that authority or that expertise. Like, I'm just gonna make a broad assumption that they do, <laughs> um, but it's more how. And I think this is what you're getting at me is how does that how does that expertise manifest itself in our actual site design? I mean, in literally every single element of that design. Like when you look at sorry, Nate. Um, no, no. no. Um, when you look at like the, the website for a startup company versus, you know, and there are tons in Colorado where, where I live. Um, uh, <laughs> Which is a great state. <laughs> yeah, uh, please come and visit. Um, but if you, if you look at websites for say startup companies versus museums for websites, I think about, okay, so I'm going to the website of that startup company often for the first time. I probably have no idea who it is. I probably have no idea how big their staff is. It might just be one person. But everything in that design Color choice, font, placement, everything is about getting me, should be, if it's a good company, getting me to trust that company and getting me to basically buy into that concept. 
And what I don't see in a lot of museum designs is that same sense. Like there's sort of an assumption that, well, you should already know why you're here probably. Um, and, and we don't necessarily have to, to sell you on that. At the same time though, I mean, one of the arguments about online um, museum web presences is that they can be inclusive. And one of the issues with our buildings, with our physical buildings, is they often don't feel inclusive. They can often, particularly to someone who's not used to museums, be quite a barrier. So there's also that sense that if you, the visual language that you use can actually create a barrier to entry, that even the actual language you use on the site can create a barrier to entry. I mean, again, to go back to online collections, if you're not familiar with how collections work, they can actually be quite um, difficult to negotiate. So there's that, that sense of how do we create authority with our visual language, but at the same time, how do we continue to make museums online inclusive, which in some ways seems quite counter to each other. And can I, because in a way that is something I'd like to problematise as well, where the main, you know, startups are really good at a great call to action. It's like one mm -hmm. thing, it's download this app, sign up, do whatever. The main call to action on a museum website is visit, maybe donate, whatever, but it's get your ass through the door. Where an online collection site is more stop, explore, consider, problematise, learn. It's almost antithetical to the main goal of a museum website. So what I'm wondering is, um, do we gain authority by sharing, by allowing our collections to be aggregated, to be in spaces where what we're saying is this is a space for authority and because we're authoritative, we can create relationships with other museums, other forms of collections? I, yes. <laughs> um, Done. <laughs> I, we were talking about authority and I read a study recently that maybe someone actually can find the link for where students were given a research task and they of course used Google for it and they had been given a hacked version of Google where the first results were total nonsense to anyone who had any familiarity with the subject. Hmm. They, they immediately clicked through, passed it off as the correct answer and did zero research beyond the top result. So that is internet authority. And we need to be aware of that, whether or not we're the top slot, that whoever is in the top slot, if someone is searching for a question that we should be able to answer, that we have the definitive answer to, and we're not the top slot, we are not the authority on that. No matter how many trappings of, of professionalism we have on our site, no matter how impressive our buildings are. So again, it's, uh, one second, I'm totally gonna get to you. <laughs> um, the last thing I want to say is we do need to be more professional on our websites. We do need to not have broken links. We do need to not have misspellings. We need to have our collections page look like someone has been on them, maintaining them, and it hasn't been touched in 30 what? years. What, what are you talking saying? about? This, this is online authority. This is the fact yeah. that someone is here. These records are, are being maintained. It's not just we, we dusted this off. It, oh, oh, that's not accurate. Don't look at our website. Because you were saying that curators don't even trust the website. That's what, that was about to be my question. Does anyone here actually go onto a collections website and trust that the information on that website is accurate? Yes. Yes? Uh, yes? I, I, mean, yes. I, I, I used to. <laughs> DNA is excluded from that. conversation. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, we had, I had, we had, I, yeah. I passed off Google. behind you, just behind you. Correct. They, Google now just recently started to say, this is a government website, it is therefore more authoritative than someone else. And it's, now that they've exposed that they're doing that, it's, it's a slippery slope and we want to be on that slope, right? We want our recommendations to carry more weight so that we can say, this is not only our best information, but these people are also smart. And, and that's authority. This linking is, somewhere else. This is an interesting point. So I yeah. think Google recently um, actually announced a partnership with news organizations and that news organizations get one a day, so they get seven a week, to say, this is our interesting article. This is the thing you should be paying attention to because we are the authority on this thing that's happening. But the same news organizations also get kind of bonus points or bonus authority for saying, but you should actually be following this article on these, these guys' sites. So, link to another news organization's website and say this is something you should trust. 
maybe that's the sort of model that in museums we can and should be using of saying, hey, we are an authority on this and this is one of our key items. But if you want to find out about this artist or this artwork or this object, you should really go and look at the V&A site or you should really go and look at the Tate's website that are doing this. And maybe, I mean, maybe that's a way of gaining authority in a different sense. Well, and I think the sort of, I don't know what this means. Um, I mean, in a way the sort of like, yeah, uh, feeds into our, our next point, but getting a little bit back to what Mia was saying, like I mean, that, that is very much this sort of aggregation. And, that, and that's what I wonder is if some of the trust doesn't come from what we still sort of traditionally think of as our authority is our ability to be fact checked on object information hmm. or whatever the equivalent may be in, in your given institution. But rather that it's like, well, the reason, like, because fundamentally to me, like, if I can grab collection objects from the VNA, from Brooklyn Museum, from whoever else, <coughs> and aggregate them together with my own collection, then, like, it's my collection starts to not mean very much. And, you know, like, my ownership of it doesn't mean very much anymore. And so, like, really, then my value starts to be. Well, you come to denverartmuseum.org, even though I have the same object repository as everybody else, but you come here because you like the way that I talk about it, that yes. I talk about that. But collection. is that the museum of the, the museum website or the venue? Like, because you mm. you always need to go to the museum itself for an experience of the actual object. Well, and I would just say well, one of the things that you know sort of is out there is libraries don't agonize about this question. You know, <laughs> that's what they do is find authoritative information bring it together, they don't have to produce it all, they connect to it, that's where their value you know, kind of mm -hmm. comes in. I don't think that's you know, a, a kind of scary notion for a museum necessarily, mm -hmm. except of course that we're trained to want to keep people you know, in our own collection. So. so what happens if we start having curators <coughs> of knowledge rather than just curators of objects? Uh, they always have been curators yeah, of objects. But have. I suppose yeah. mean, as in having someone whose job is to mm -hmm. curate the online space, and I don't just mean design it, but actually, so some, I think it's so, some of what I think we're saying here <laughs> is authority. Authority online is being online, being active online, not right. just setting yeah. it and forgetting it. That is, I don't yeah. think we can we can do that anymore. That's what I'm hearing. I think that's a good point. I think sure. that is the human face on our websites, and I think a lot of us are coming around to that. It, it was very objective for a long time, where everything we designed was third person. We're very much behind this right. institutional voice. Everything was in the institutional voice, and I think we're. It's that's a tricky one. I think people are uncomfortable with it still, but it's a great idea. I think as a segue into sort of between that and the next question. Um, less so for art museums because there are fewer objects. I've always had this kind of envy of the National Gallery with like 2,000, 3,000 objects. Um, where I've worked in museums that have millions if it's a natural history collection or hundreds of thousands. Um, and one of the challenges is as we start to put collections online, the mess, the dirty secret that is the really awful crappy records in our collections management systems, they're online too. So people can discover errors, they can discover fuzziness, they can discover bits where someone just made stuff up. Um, okay, I'll take that back. But um, <laughs> that really challenges. It's a great transparency, but it also really challenges the sense of what authority means because we don't actually know that much about our collections. If we're yes. a social history museum, we just don't know. We know the tip of the iceberg. We know the really the hero objects. We know some of the kind of workday objects that make good filler and exhibitions. And then there are boxes and boxes and boxes of stuff that we don't know about.
Yeah, I mean, the question was, can you can that be an opportunity to engage audiences? And I would say yes, because I work on crowdsourcing games for museums. But, <laughs> yeah. but I think this when I asked before, who trusts online collections? That's getting at the crux of the issue, is that we put so much of our collection information online, but it's not always vetted beforehand. It sort of goes up there and we go through and try and work through it. But it might be information from that's 20 years old at the moment. Hundreds. Or oh, hundreds, <laughs> yeah, precisely. And so at the moment, a lot of what's gone online is not necessarily the hero objects, which have or should have accurate and up-to-date and excellent information. There's also now information online about the stuff that we haven't really paid that much attention to. OK, but what about, uh, sorry. That's awesome, mm -hmm. actually. Yeah, that's fantastic. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, because in a way, it, like when Sue said vetted, like I just kind of kicked a little bit because yeah. that word bothers me. Because <laughs> I, I don't, like when I think about vetting, I'm sort of like, I don't know, what the hell does that mean? Like mm -hmm. in, in, in a way, I kind of feel like, and, and this sort of bridges collections and authority, you know, like for me, if when I look at, in the case of an art object, the title, or let's let's say a more obvious one, the, the attribution for a work, if online I saw a continuum of answers with dates attached, yes, versus yes, the way that we always do it, which is here's here's who made this object, and if we find out something different next week, we'll change that and throw the old name down the memory hole forever. Yes, you know, and so like I mean that's. When I think about it that way, and, and here we have a problem, obviously, because our museum structures are very much built to, I mean, like, collections management systems most often don't allow you to have multiple historical values for, for pieces of data. So, which means, yeah, sorry, well, maybe except for Adler, but, um, <laughs> um, you know, so it, in a way like that, that kind of like, there is a single answer now and forever always is sort of hard coded yes. into into our thinking and into our designs. But so, I, I think that's exactly right. I think it's so significant to be able to track. In, in fact, as a researcher, what I want is to be able to look at an object and see the changes that have happened in the object's data history. So basically, the, every museum object page needs a discussion thing and a history thing, like Wikipedia. Yeah. 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 Or we could just put it on there. Significant. <laughs> 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 That's the interesting question. <laughs> yeah. It goes yeah. back to your talk, right? <laughs> so why don't you use all the tools that are out there? So. Um, do you want to talk explicitly about collections? Yeah. Well, I think one of the really, the questions that I don't have an answer to is, are online collections a big opportunity that we just haven't figured out how to exploit, how to make discoverable, how to make them accessible, how to fit them into people's lives in ways that make sense? or are they actually just a dull dead end that are only ever going to suit the 1%? <laughs> uh, yeah, comments on that from the audience? <laughs> I mean, I love ideas trying to bring in sort of communities of passion, you know, into your museum site because there are people who, boy, they nerd out about button design, you know, or whatever. I mean, like that is <laughs> that's their thing, and you know, no curator can be an expert in every object, but probably somebody is. So you know, trying to figure out ways to engage them, like you all did too, I think is great. But see, this is so. I'm going to get into my big picture vision here because <laughs> this is my this is my at the moment we still tend to think about our collections at an object level and at a collection level. But 
the internet allows us to aggregate information in very different ways from the way we've been able to do it before. And the internet allows us to join our information in different ways from ways that we've done it before. There's an example that I use. A, a guy recently uh, did tone and geographic analysis study of 30 years of news archives and was able to see uh, that there's real, in there's patterns that emerge looking at, say, when revolutions happen. And you can start to see these patterns and, and new knowledge can start to emerge from those aggregation of sort of mass information and mass data in a different way from um, simply if he was looking at a couple of newspapers. And I wonder if it's not the same thing with our collections, if actually once we start to free our collections from being just object-centred and just collection-focused, but actually start to look at the way we can aggregate that information in different ways, I don't, then new knowledge can emerge. I don't think that should be necessarily our job. We just need to get it out there in a yes. way that is usable right. for someone else to make that call. If we have a good idea, do it. But yes. our collections online right now are not for that. No, They're not. Okay. but I think it's how we enable What that. are they for? Yeah. No, I mean, that's not how they've been built. Right. Sure, yes. but they should be. My question still stands. <laughs> Yeah. I think, okay, They're so <laughs> <laughs> yeah. they are partly for the fact that the public owns the objects and we should be giving them access to the objects. So they're partly just the right thing to do. But making them accessible and making them usable for people is the harder mm -hmm. task. But what does is, what is usability for collections actually look like? I mean, this is, this is what I have such a hard time with is like, well, how do you use a an object in the museum? Well, I mean, I mean, this one. I mean, okay. oh, it's getting heated <laughs> now. <laughs> but well, I, you know what I mean. Yeah, well, but, no, but I mean, this is this is this is my concern. Is I feel like most online collections <coughs> that I've seen to this point are built almost on the assumption that the end point of that digital experience is a physical visit to the museum, where you are in the presence of the object because that is the quote unquote authentic, and I don't necessarily mean to denigrate that term, but that's, that's the valid experience that you can have. I think, I mean, I've worked on a lot of uh, specialist websites where they are very specifically aimed at research communities. Um, and from two points of view, one, growing up in Australia where you have to travel 24 hours to go and see a significant museum collection, and the other, working for museums that have the type reference collection for that thing. So. If you are the collection of Roman pottery, then people all over the world should be able to use that without having to travel to Hackney. Um, so that is the point of museum collections. I think too much effort has gone into the presentation of the objects on the web rather than the accessibility of the data. He says that too much effort has gone into the presentation of them on the web. It used to look nice, but right, and not how the data is presented online. And that's what makes that to me is what makes it usable online. And <coughs> it's so, and we can using that same data, we can still make them pretty. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but don't just make them pretty. Yes. Oh, sorry. Isn't it interesting that, you know, museums, I'm sure 99% of our mission statements are about education, you know, but there's that, like, education up to a limit kind of thing that keeps happening, which, you know, if we can burst through that to make these shareable collections, I think that's where education is really happening. I think the other thing is then it becomes really important for us to be able to let other people know, other than our traditional researchers know, that we have this wealth of data. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's one thing to have an art museum and have art historians come and look at what you've got. But what about someone who's looking at um, economics and the way that uh, paint 
colours have changed over a 100-year period and see how that relates to economics. Or having, say, um, uh, designers, so sort of physical designers, looking for solutions that have maybe already existed but have been forgotten because they can access our collections and they know to access our collections. Well, I think that's only going to happen when we have aggregated collections. And I'm not a fan of like massively aggregated sets of data because they're impossible to navigate. They're impossible to find your way through. It's impossible to have kind of shared terminology that goes across everything. But what they do is they break open the silos. The history of museum collections is the history of strange men going around the world and buying things and sending them back. Yeah. It's the history of when a city had a gold rush and they had money to buy art. It's a really strange collection of a series of accidents. If we can break down those silos and re-aggregate content in ways that make sense, in kind of smaller, more curated ways, mm -hmm. then I think we're providing a new form of accessibility. And that's a, that's a form of content push. That becomes a new <coughs> content block, sort of. You know, like you were saying, it's not just harvesting. We're not asking them to pull it. It's pushing. Let's go here and then to the back. Is that cool? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like first, uh, Yeah. From a contemporary uh, view. So, the academic discussion about the value of online collection doesn't mean much to me. So, but one of the things that seems to be uh, like an obsession of whatever the authority is, is a sort of like this like continual academic slam on this research. And I have the discussion with a colleague about uh, uh, that, that fantastic arms and armor uh, collection that they have. There's some presentation of it on the web. You can definitely go on the academic uh, slant of who made the weapon, what kind of materials, uh, what era, all kinds of stuff, but there's also this whole segment, I don't know, of like rent vests <laughs> and, and D&D &D, uh, yeah. players that could assign like hit points to those weapons all kinds of other material that has nothing to do really with this academic value that we always seem to aspire to. A, sort, a certain like uh, level of control over this conversation right. that we are always the authority of. These objects can have value that has nothing to do with what mm -hmm. the museum presents. Yeah. And we insist always to have this like control over this kind of like, no, this is what it is, and this is how we're going to present it. <laughs> That's total. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, 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 no. I mean, that's that's completely fascinating, and I mean, I yeah. I, mm -hmm. I think, I mean, it's it's definitely a, a change in mindset. You know, it, it causes us to think of ourselves as being like data providers who happen to have objects versus object stewards that occasionally provide data, right? Right. You know, and and saying that okay, maybe the real value of what we do that's is right. not contained within our sort of intellectual purview but is actually downstream somewhere. And I mean, we're starting to see this with like, you know, large municipal data sets like NYC.gov, like the big apps competition where they said, here's a whole bunch of data that we happen to collect. We can't think of anything to do with it, but maybe you can, you know. That's why we can't do pre-segmentation of our audiences because we can't know what's, what's good about our stuff until right. they do it. Right. Rob, yeah, Rob that's nice.
So, so come back to us when you. <laughs> yeah, when you fix that, that's great. Yeah, thanks. But that's what I mean. Teaching people that the first thing on Google may not be the right answer. That's. I don't know how we do that. I mean, maybe we also just need to. Museums are not very good at saying there is no right answer because we like to be the one with the right answer. So. Well, and I think I kind of want to distinguish between like content that I don't care if I own and content that I very much want to own. You know, and, and in that case, it's sort of the opposite model of like, you know, the objects in our collection we own, but the data about those I think should be anywhere and everywhere. The interpretation, which is this sort of like nebulous sort of construct, is the part that I very much want people to come to denverartmuseum.org to see, you know. So I don't know where I'm going with that, but. <laughs> Unless you're a school kid. <laughs> uh, unless you're a school kid. Yes, correct. But for 99%, I mean, the, uh, when we have free time, we decide to go to a beach or to a museum. Of course, to learn something, it's not like to go to a beach. It's like down to travel. So it's a leisure activity. But he's browsing of online data or searching for a correct answer in history or leisure activity. Most probably not. I have a weird dream for museum collections. <laughs> Which is that, you know that sense like you Google something and you end up on Wikipedia and then suddenly it's two hours later and you're on some completely unrelated mm. article. You don't know how you got there. You've just been in this zone of learning interesting stuff. I'd love a museum <coughs> website like that. I'd love us to tell stories through our objects to provide kind of interesting ways of looking at the world where you've suddenly lost two hours on a museum website and you've just had a great time but you didn't even notice time passing. Yeah, I think so. You, you'll see that our question is, what if this isn't the right model at all? And I think one of the things is, we really still think about museums as being about their physical. Um, not, I mean, we have online museums, so that's not always the case. But what happens if the museum website actually becomes a really key part of what we do rather than the addition to what we do? So what if it actually becomes the destination and there's a way of having um, leisure but something else so you know Wikipedia can you know you start just because it's interesting and then you continue and you know why can't we do that um, there's Do you think it's because we try and provide answers instead of provoking? Uh, mm. Tie in, yeah. yeah. <laughs> to this morning. Yeah, well, that's, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's two ways. I mean, one is that um, we can do these beautifully produced, tailored, targeted experiences, which might be a video exploring something or that kind of really preset thing. Here is something that we think is interesting. We're giving this to you. But there's also the possibility of being a platform for engaging questions. I think the, the challenge there, of course, is that you never know what it is about an object that's going to catch people like that. Mm. 
you know, I think, and that's, you know, there's again sort of the art side of the kinds of stuff we do, you know. Yeah. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, there's a question over there. Another. I think, uh, I don't know if I can summarise the question, but one thing that it's difficult for an online museum to do or an online collection is to have that appointment dynamic that a museum visit has. You're in a space, you're there at a particular time, in a particular social context. Um, it's time out of other concerns of life. Mm. You're in this kind of really inspiring space where what you're doing is absorbing. And that is a, a great way to create memories and it's a great way to have reference points that you can take with you. Where on a website you can have 20 other tabs open, you might have Messenger going, Twitter, whatever. They're, we're in an inherently distracted space online. Um, and I think that's a real challenge for museum websites, to create that sense of being in the presence of something, not necessarily in the physical presence of an object, but in the presence of space in our lives. Do we need to? Good question. Yeah, a lot of yeses out there. It's a lot of yeses, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's a lot of yes. Just Going back to your, your comments about Wikipedia, because um, I'm, I'm, I do the same thing you do. I get lost on them all night. But it's easy because there's 30 trillion different links. Every third word is a link, you know. So I guess my question is, how do we figure out how much time and human capital to invest in trying to become more linked internally, um, you know, whether it's the author or, or the curator or were you suggesting linking outside to other, to other sites? And then, and then what is the cutoff between how much time and money goes into that and then figuring out if it's worth it, you know, financially? Yeah, I mean, there, there's a cost in linking anyway and maintaining things when links die and they go 404. Um, but in terms of sort of machine stuff, we can do entities. We can say this is a person, a place, a right. date let's link to our little pot of other friendly museums that have the same kind of stuff. Um, you can crowdsource it, you can say, you know, use, open up to other forms of authority, that other, those other conversations. Um, I, I think, I just want to say that I don't think we can possibly solve that with manpower, right. unless, unless yeah. we open it up to, to our audiences, the public, and, let, and then it becomes our own Wikipedia, and it's, it's a weird line, but we can, there are better and better tools all the time to automate 80% of that, which is better than we're doing now. So, <laughs> you, you know, uh, I mean, there's this problem is that well, we've got all these kind of open-ended questions, and they kind of, in my mind, are swirling back to you. Well, we're not really sure what success looks like, right? Or it's mm -hmm. hard to pin down. You can't measure it, right? I, and the thought that popped into my mind is, well, I don't really care about measuring hits or attendance or distribution. I, I, I would love to know how to measure epiphany. <laughs> I thought one way, I saw something, and now I think a different way. And so that's kind of a critical thing for me, because if I could do that, then I could try to optimize for a pivot. <laughs> and so then I would know, well, at this page, works better, you know, I get a higher or a or two on this page, because it's got more links, or it's got this, or that. You don't have these basic metrics other than really like following footsteps. Um, so we, I don't know how to measure it. 
<laughs> but I mean, we don't really know how to measure that in our buildings either. No. Like yeah. we just sort of assume that it happens. It's just that it's well, so, it's you know. I mean, it's, uh, uh, anecdotal. Yeah. But similarly online, someone's going to run off and tweet like, holy cow, this is great. Or, I mean, I think there are clues that we can use to detect that. Can I ask, Rob, what makes you experience epiphany online anyway? I'm sorry, I don't understand. Have you had an online epiphany yeah. and what was it about? Yeah, <laughs> have you? I mean, d d is... And seriously, go deep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, we had two that would be fantastic. questions up in the middle. Yeah. Well, we were, you know, when talking about um, telling stories with your online and give you a really vulnerable experience, one of the ways that I have that happen is with mobile apps. Um, because if I'm looking at my phone or my iPad, I often do that on the subway. And I'm, I have it so I carve out time when I'm not distracted by anything. Can you see Rob's epiphany and then we'll get you epiphany? Okay, so in this morning's uh, session, I think I had several epiphanies. Uh, but one of them was that uh, Translate is a online one. Uh, so uh, it's not just the So we don't have to be the end point of that epiphany. Right. We can be part of the chain. Yes. Yeah. Right. 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 And yeah. it's the evolution of thought. We're going to just say it. we are. <laughs> That's right. We declare it. I think that in the, in the notion of bringing together the, the metrics of epiphany, there's actually a case in hand that we can all look at tonight at the, at the Hive Museum, where they have their mobile app for the Picasso to Warhol show, and they are utilizing image recognition to give you a photograph piece, recognize, and then you utilize your image and their data to send and share that. And they are logging all of the interactions that occur through those photographs taken by people's individual phones and have yet to know what, what they're doing with that log. So, I mean, like, that could answer or be a way to figure out how we measure online. <laughs> and, and it's a good conversation point since we're all here in Atlanta. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the things that we might, and certainly in the past have done, and now I think we're much more conscious of not doing, is sort of murdering epiphany by providing too much information. I mean, you know, it's a kind of funny thing to do, but, but you know, if we interpret too much, 
you know, what we've done that stopped all that, so. Which ultimately is just like in the art museum or, you know, where we go through these trends of let's give everyone so much wall text so that they understand everything versus let's actually give the artwork yeah. room to breathe. So to some extent we're coming to this funny place where on one hand we see the value in lots of data and being able to aggregate data and being able to make new use of this data, but also being able to give our objects room to breathe and not forcing things on people. So maybe right. we need to find a way of actually balancing those two where you can make it so that, you know, there's room to breathe, but also... But that's, I mean, that... Uh, I remember hearing a story years ago when the trend was for no, basically very little wall interpretation. Um, and a new museum opened and visitors were writing on the wall, what is this? Because they didn't yes. know, they need yeah. some information. Mm -hmm. yes. And you never quite know what people need in those 80 words to help them interpret the object. Yes. But I think the promise of mobile apps, the promise of kind of better in gallery interpretation and online things is that you can tailor your experience. You can say, I only want to know what mood the artist was in when they made this versus I want to know what it was like to burn your hair using this curling iron. That kind of, you can say, I want experiential, I want emotion, I want hardcore knowledge, I want stats and figures, whatever. Um, has anyone, this is so off topic in some ways, but has anyone downloaded the Björk Biophilia app? No, yes. Not. Okay, so Björk's just put out her new album, but along with it, she's put out a full app that comes with, there's animations, there's things that you can play to make music using sounds that are the same sounds she uses, but it also comes with essays written by academics on the science behind the songs and I lose myself for hours in this thing and I'm not really an app person I tend to with the exception of games I tend to play it for a little while and then you know move on whereas I keep going back to this and I keep revisiting it because there keep being new ways of exploring it new hidden depths and this sort of idea of um, connecting to things that are bigger than ourselves, but also having new ways of entry sort of becomes interesting. I, I, I'm not always a massive fan of Björk's albums, but I really like, I love this because there's the multiple level of experience and multiple ways of exploring it. And I think that's something that's a really nice thing. But it changes from just being, this is your album, to this is your album, but here are other ways that you can gain meaning and gain depth, and here are some other places that you can go. Well, I think, I mean, like, definitely, I often think, like, one of the things that m makes me hopefully good at my job is that actually I, I don't really care about art that much. Mm. <laughs> like, in, in the sense that it's like, you know, like... You're unencumbered I, by it. <laughs> yeah, like, I mean, I don't have much invested in, like, the survival of our artworks, let's say, you know, like, in, in, and I don't inherently believe that I can have a very special experience just being in the presence of a work of art, you know. Yeah, yeah, keep it right. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's like you take a Renaissance painting that I am not going to care about at all and load it up with information and I'm yours, mm -hmm. like I'm, you know, I'm, I'm there. And, you know, and so, it, you know, I kind of feel for me like that's, and, but that's the kind of experience I want to have, but you know, both in, in, in the space and, and online. It's like, you know, for me, it's like, those are signifiers of information that I don't have yet and want to have. Is it information or storytelling? Go Isn't explain that, that a little bit more. Go ahead. Well, it's, before There's, Nate gets mad at me. The idea of storytelling is really uh, sort of another minor obsession I seem to have a lot is um, snackable content. Painted this.
and we learn for learning. And any person could basically learn for learning anything. History, culture, medicine, uh, like aquarium, the fishes. I don't like fishes, but I do like to learn with the second. So, uh, but the thing is, uh, again, uh, the question online. I mean, when I'm online, I'm not in this state even to learn for learning. When I'm online, I'm already overwhelmed with information. My browser, there's a Twitter open, there's my email. Like everybody who is tweeting now, they're constantly doing that, that or I'm also black. Uh, overwhelmed with information. Online, uh, there is very, very hard to make the same, uh, to put person in the same psychological position as uh, in using for learn for learning. Maybe is the way not to do it at all. So just to provide information, not in this way for learning, for teaching, but for practical learning. And but this basically means that museum are going to call Wikipedia in general, because Wikipedia is the final, uh, uh, the, the, the end of the mountain of uh, practical. I think there is some learning for learning on Wikipedia, but that was an awesome comment. Actually, it's not my comment. It's a book called, I just tweeted the name of this book, as a research made from the music experience. Awesome. We have one last question somewhere. Well, I just wanted to kind of a shout out about this movie that's out right now. Has anybody seen the Nolan the So the point of a <laughs> to sum up, <laughs> um, look at how cute those pandas are. I can't even believe it. Um, there's like four of them, and they're drinking. Um, so thanks everybody for hanging in there. Um, I'm not even going to attempt to sum that up, but I really appreciate you kind of taking this journey with us and allowing us to go in 800 different potentially useful and potentially not useful directions. Um, um, we'll keep watching that hashtag. Um, feel free to talk to any one of us. Like, definitely want to keep this conversation going for sure. So um, let's keep talking. And thank you, everybody, so much. Thanks.